Islam will continue to be triumphant until there have been 12 Khulafa, all of them from Al Quraysh. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. This is my brother, my executor, and my successor among you, so listen to him and obey. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. Whoso obeys me obeys God. Whoever disobeys me disobeys God. Whoever disobeys my commander disobeys me. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Two system of government, two visions for life on earth. Whichever is true changes everything. This is Christ and Khulafa. Today, we're going to be talking about red cows. Yes, red cows, otherwise known as the red heifer. Um, if you've been following the news lately, the red heifer uh, is a breed of cow um, that has kind of been extinct for a long while and recently brought back by a uh, bunch of cattle farmers in Texas. Uh, it has biblical significance in that it was used um, as an offering uh, and its ashes were used to purify the tabernacle and purify the priests um, in the uh, book of Numbers and also in the book of Leviticus. Um, and this has caused a whole big stir, right? Um, uh, not only among uh, Orthodox Jews, like super religious Orthodox Jews in Israel, um, but also in the Muslim world. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, James, let me ask you a question. In all the things you've been reading uh, about the red heifer, how does the Islamic world see it? So there's a range of things. Like a lot of people on the internet are basically seeing it as a sign of the coming of Dajjal, which is like sort of the Islamic version of the Antichrist. Um, which, you know, is, is kind of funny to an extent, except when you realize part of the premise for the October 7th attack by Hamas was actually this idea of the Jews bringing the red heifer to Israel to sacrifice, to make way to destroy Al-Aqsa and build a new temple in its place. Like, the, in a war room somewhere, in a strategy room, among all the sort of like rational logistical uh, considerations being made, this red cow is actually like a major part of people's thinking in some parts of the world. So there's some people who are more cautious, but then there's just a ton of like YouTube conspiracies about this as well. So it's all very uh, weird to watch. I was reading an article in Al Jazeera that um, kind of paints this as... Um an insidious action, right? That's meant towards um, the destruction of the al Aska Mosque and the reconstruction of the Third Temple. Um, and it's caused, uh, you know, apparently a lot of stir in Israel and um, some anger among the Muslims. The thing I keep thinking about is when, uh, I can't remember his name, I think it was it wasn't Ehud Barak, but it was one of the, the Jewish prime ministers walked along the wall of the Temple Mount, right? And, um, you know, on the, the top of it, <clears throat> near Al-Aqsa, and caused this huge, like, they're trying to rebuild the Third Temple. They're trying to, you know, stir up the the the, the, um, the people against us and, and destroy Al-Aqsa. Uh, so, what do you think about that? Well... This is very interesting to me because on the one hand, it, 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 to an extent, it is a thing, right? There, there are a group of Jews and some specific types of Christians <laughs> who are very, very invested in a third temple being built. Right. Um, so for, but it's, it, to me, it doesn't seem like, like a super mainstream school of Judaism, right? So there's a video, there's a there's video series called the children are ready from the Temple Institute. And it, it, it shows this like high resolution video of this old man being led by these children and looking at Jerusalem and seeing the temple being built there. 
Right. That video has like 400,000 views, which is not nothing, but it's like three times as small <laughs> as my like video of Benny Hinn with a lightsaber. So it's not like, it, it, it's not like. If you've never seen the Benny Hinn with a lightsaber video, you should Google it. <laughs> And tag the Almighty Initiative. It's my, it's my claim to fame in Christian circles. Right. But it's like that video has more views than the, let's rebuild the third Temple video. So, it, like, to me, it seems like, it, it seems kind of like a sort of fringe element, not like the Netanyahu administration has a plan to actively rebuild the third Temple. What's, what's your experience with this? Okay, so the third Temple is significant in Judaism. Um, because it's it stands and the prince, it says that the prince, meaning the Messiah, will be in the third temple um, and there will be sacrifices. So wrapping your mind around that uh, as a, a Jew means that a lot of things have to change, right? With even just the geography. Um, <coughs> there currently sits the Aqsa Mosque. Um, the third temple would have to be rebuilt. Uh, and, you know, the Jews um, are waiting for their Messiah. As a Christian, you would look at it and say, well, we believe that the Messiah has come. And this is a, um, this is, this is, uh, will happen after the second coming of Christ. That he will be in Jerusalem, he will sit in the third temple, <laughs> and he will rule the nations from there. Um, so, you know... There are definitely like like ultra orthodox or ultra like the the article in Al Jazeera calls them ultra nationalists because I think that's easier, right? It's easier to sit there and say, well, they're ultra nationalists. And listen, ultra nationalists like all you have to do is go back to like the first and second century. A lot of the ultra nationalists who wanted um, um, uh, independence from whoever. The, or Jews who wanted independence from whoever had, you know, like like a military domain over the area, isn't usually tied at all to religiousness. Um, you know, a lot of times they're not religious figures. They just want to arm and fight back and gain their independence. So I think that that's kind of like, it's a stretch to sit there and say it's ultra-nationalist. Um, I think that sometimes the two go hand in hand. So you have like like this really orthodox view of things. And then, you know, that can bleed over into, you know, um, while well, Israel just has to be a completely Jewish state with, you know, no Gentiles, uh, no one else, only Jews. Um, and then let's go back to the biblical borders, right? That's, that's you know, where a lot of the conflict comes in at. Um, the third temple is a real thing. I mean, it's in the book of Ezekiel, and it's totally spelled out that it will exist. You and I had this conversation a while back about how, like, you know, is it is it like um, like prefigurative, right? Or is it is it like a like a like a um, you know, is it an idea? So I actually have let, let's let's come to this later because I have okay. some very specific thoughts on the temple okay. in Ezekiel, and I th I, th I actually think most people get this wrong including people i tend to agree with on these things right but just just dialing in getting a little bit more clarity on so you, you ask the average orthodox jew right now should we right now demolish al-aqsa and build a third temple in its place right now this very second what are they going to say okay so orthodox is a convoluted word right it's a very you know it's like calling everybody in america a christian mm -hmm. I, I think that there are levels of orthodox judaism um, and it's practiced differently in different places. Uh, within Israel, you know, there are Haredi Jews, and, and, and um, they are, you know, in favor of demolishing the temple, right? Uh, demolishing the, the, the mosque and, and, and rebuilding the third temple, and are taking actions like this, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, to bring the red heifer from Texas and to prepare and everything else like that. That does not mean that they are going to figure out a way to demolish the temple. Um, that temple, the, the, uh, the, mosque the mosque is not going anywhere, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, not politically, not, um, <clears throat> not uh, you know, st not in any strategic manner, right? Um, if they had their way, it probably would, but they'll never get enough power to do that. So, so how... 
if you want to talk about how much power do the Haredis actually have? They have an influence. You know, Israel's system is parliamentary and, um, you know, they get some votes, right, in their parliamentary system. Um, in the current government, the reason why Netanyahu was able to come back was because uh, he had some, um, you know, support from the far right, right? And uh, it happens in every presidential election, right? So if you have a leftist candidate, they're going to have support from the far left, right? If you have a far, if you have a right wing candidate, they're going to have support from the far right. Um, it just it just happens. So in this particular case, uh, Netanyahu had to make a deal with them to be named prime minister, um, and they have a say. And it's been really controversial because, for instance, they have tried to enforce um, immigration law in Israel that is saying that anyone who is a uh, Christian cannot immigrate to Israel, right? Uh, particularly if you are of Jewish descent, but if you, if you become a Christian. A friend of mine um, took her case to the Supreme Court and lost and had to leave and has decided that she wants to be an immigration lawyer and help people immigrate. Um, wherever they're from, right? Um, but she tried to make uh, Aliyah to Israel and was denied. That is the influence that the far right, the Orthodox, have had um, in this current government. Uh, I think that you can see, and this is just me being honest, I think that you can see their influence in some of the wartime strategy, too, that's happening in Gaza. Um, I, I think that what happened on October 7th has kind of, you know, given them a louder voice mm -hmm. um, and empowered them to, you know, kind of um, push for a more um, uh, more thorough operation in Gaza than they would have actually probably done before. And whether or not that's justified strategically is a different story. But, I, you know, just because somebody stands up and says something doesn't mean that it's going to be taken. But so, now, now you're allowed to say it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you, if you have this sort of like, you know, loud but sort of concise minority, which believes it's kind of like ushering in the end times, them and Hamas kind of like bounce off each other perfectly. Oh, right. right. They are the opposite ends of the spectrum. Right. Except that in Gaza, uh, Hamas has, you know, the final say. Right. They have the ultimate authority in Gaza. So, um, you know, what they want, religion, how they want it is going to be practiced the way Hamas wants it to be. You know, like social policy, you know, economics, all of it. Wartime, you know, let's attack this, let's attack that is all controlled by Hamas. So in Israel, that's not the case. Which, as a Christian, can I just say <coughs> that I, I, I... <laughs> I do not, I mean, I, I believe in the second coming of Jesus and I like, we all yearn for that, but like, can I just say that I do not like, uh, even want to think about, um, a war break, like any mosque being demolished and any sort of like sacrilegious, uh, thing happening there that would bring on this, like, you know, whatever we're seeing with God, like Gaza and Israel right now, it'd be like way worse than that and I wouldn't want to see that um because I don't know I think we just were everyone has like you know the Christians are like okay second coming of Jesus I guess the Jews are like oh the, the first coming of the Messiah and then the Muslims are like are like when this happens when you see this happen like everybody like like this means war like we're not we're not um this uh this is a deception um that the prophet um uh, I mean, warned us about and we're not gonna um this is this is the worst thing that could happen right and so then it's like 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 my brain can't wrap around like i really can't see a, the steps a b c into like like i don't know so the peace that's going to be brought into that region with with jesus's second coming well so f for me, right, what I keep seeing is video titles like Red Heifer Prophecy. Right. There is no Red Heifer Prophecy. Mm -mm. Right. There's no prophecy that this cow has to die 
that has some religious significance that means the temple starts that starts a countdown to you know the messiah coming that's not in the jewish sources at least at least not in the scriptures not in the scriptures but so a change happened about 200 years after the messiah came right the the rabbis <laughs> changed everything they changed like the role of what a rabbi was right a rabbi went from a teacher of the scriptures to an interpreter of the law right one who gave um an opinion okay which opened the way for a whole lot of other changes so what happened was the rabbis would take things from the scripture and continually keep building them into this thing called the mishnah which became part of the talmud and a lot of the things about the red heifer and about the coming of the messiah and all the other things are wrapped around um like interpretation. A, a, a rabbinic interpretation right but is there a prophecy would, would you say which now christians are looking at going it's a prophecy right In it does mission? not have biblical authority okay yeah. because there's nothing that says that you know when the tenth cow is slaughtered because nine have been slaughtered up till now mm -hmm. all the way you know up until the romans and when the tenth one is slaughtered that it will be in the hands of the messiah right the messiah will be you know it will herald the the the, the coming or arrival of messiah and that's not anywhere in the bible mm -hmm. right like that's not that's not in either set of scriptures new right. testament old testament no n neither actually does the red heifer come up in islamic prophecy about the end times as well mm. right but you know Internet rumor mill gonna internet rumor mill. Because mm -hmm. it's killing a cow, like, I mean, is that like well, very bad? No, for, it's not bad for, in, can, uh, in Islam. No, no, can no. I just, can I just add one more thing? The, the reason that the cow is sacrificed is to purify the tabernacle and to purify the priests. Right, 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 right. right. From the presence of death, something severe, not mm -hmm. like your normal, you know, go out and ritually well, that's why it's only been done nine times something. right only been died, done nine times yeah and it is something that would say um this is going to threaten the purity of the entire mm -hmm. tabernacle mm -hmm. it doesn't happen a lot it's not actually a major sacrifice right it doesn't you know atone for a sin like the one on yom mm -hmm. kippur did right like you know it doesn't do any of those things mm -hmm. but one would look at it and say that the way that the sacrifice transpires is linked to, like, why would we have to sacrifice this unless there was a temple, right? Which is any of the sacrifices. Why would you have to make any of the sacrifices? Sure. If, if there's a temple. But this one in particular is like, um, well, you know, we'll take the ashes and we'll mix them with water and then we'll, we'll use it to purify the temple and then the temple will be functional, right? It'll be like, it'll be, sure. it'll be um, kosher. Just like what's we'll in, in numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Described so. in numbers. So let's, 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 um, you know, wrap up the show, like if we come to our final section here by talking about the sort of Christian significance of the third temple and should we care? So here's my position on this, right? Um, Revel Revelation, the end of Revelation says there is no temple in the eternal Jerusalem because God dwells in the city with us. So Jesus says, you know, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it again in three days, referring to his body. Right. So we believe Jesus is the temple, you know, for all time, our access to God. I don't, I believe Ezekiel is actually talking about the second temple, not the third temple. Um, because if you look at Ezekiel, the if you get to I think it's th chapter thirty-eight, yeah. the, when it describes the plans, it doesn't say this will definitely exist in the future. It says, "Read these plans to the children of Israel. If they are ashamed, if they repent, then this is what they can build." Um, and if you look at the midrash, they are actually trying to build Herod's temple to the dimensions of Ezekiel's temple. Right, right. that's the plan they're building to. Sure. And they don't, you know, and they don't achieve it. And, and so what Ezekiel describes is this, you know, beautiful relationship between the Jewish people and God. And it says, with your wall next to mine, with only a wall between you and the presence of God, which is not the Christian paradigm. The Christian paradigm is the wall, the temple and the curtain has been torn. Mm -hmm. And there's now no 
wool between in Matthew. like the Gospels, Mark, Matthew. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, Paul talks about the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles being torn down. So, essentially, if we have this relationship with God where there's no wall between us, right? To 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 put up a wall between God and the Jews wouldn't make sense because, like, they have the same access that we have through Jesus. So I don't I don't personally think Ezekiel is talking about the third temple. The one thing that makes me kind of wonder, okay, is there a temple again? Would be Zechariah chapter 14, which seems to describe a temple in Jerusalem at, you know, the end times. But but, but I have no vested interest in a third temple being built. Yeah. Nor do I have any particular acrimony for Jews attempting it. I, I just don't believe in any significance for it. My, mm -hmm. I disagree with you on whether or not, I, I believe there will be a third temple. And um, my reasoning is that, uh, first of all, those passages talk clearly about the prince dwelling there, right? So that's just not anyone. That is the, the Messiah, right? It's not the son of David. It's not any of those things. It's the prince. And it's the prince in uh, Judaism is a king, and the king is not allowed to dwell in those places. Right, the king, the king's sons are not allowed to dwell in those places. They are not allowed to act as priests. So this person is different. This person <clears throat> has the uh, authority not only to rule Israel but also to um, act as a priest and sit uh, in the third temple, and is also ruling from the third temple. So uh, you know when you take all of the other like passages that talk about you know Messiah's return. Um, him ruling the nations with a rod of iron and, um, you know, even the way that we look at the passage in Zechariah and the second coming, you know, I can see a, I, I mean, I believe it. I believe that there'll be a third temple someday. That being said, you know, there's no like, there's nothing anywhere that says, and they will be ashamed and they will take their axes and their pickaxes and their construction machines and everything and tear down the Al-Aqsa and rebuild it. Now, you know, what was it? Was it um, one of the Left Behind books or something like that, right? Like, I know those books are ridiculous, you know. But in that particular regard, the reason why the Third Temple was built was there was an earthquake, right? There was an earthquake at the Temple Mount and it destroyed the mosque and then they rebuilt the temple then. See, something like that, yeah. So so what I'm saying is... <laughs> I don't think human intervention, because we don't believe it's that. It's, the, it's, it's hard to, I mean, whether or not I believe it or not is a different story, because yeah, I could be completely yeah, yeah, wrong. Yeah. And, you know, people could mm -hmm. use, like, the this current thing politically and say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, well, you know, we're going to not only, you know, um, get rid of Hamas, but... We're going to get rid of the reasons why Hamas is here, right? And pull up the mosque. I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think I, that yeah. Jews everywhere would like turn on the government, you know, instantly. Nobody wants that mm -hmm. except for a small fringe. So as far as, you know, me being a believer, right? And, and understanding that, you know, um, in the natural, it doesn't seem possible. Um, and that it would have to be something like an act of God to make it happen. Mm -hmm. If there were an act of God and if that things did progress to them, <clears throat> um, I can definitely see uh, room for the third temple, not only in the scripture, but also like in the natural. That being said, I could be wrong. So, so, right? so his, <laughs> counter pitch, counter pitch, counter pitch. So I, again, I agree with what you're saying about the prince in Ezekiel 38 being the Messiah. No doubt, right? I, I agree. However, again, I think that prophecy is kind of conditional. I, well, th I think it's the ghost of Judaism future. It's kind of what would have happened if Israel had recognized Jesus as the Messiah when he came. I disagree. And Should, because when Messiah comes back, he's not going to rule from like the King David in Jerusalem. Well, okay. Right? Here, 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 like, so here's my, here's my, like, like, my counterpitch, <laughs> right? Um, he, he, so does, Jesus comes back, goes to Jerusalem. And it's like goes to the dome of the rocks. Like, oh, this is nice. I like this. And you know, turns it into his penthouse, third temple. Third temple. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, very interesting. So, on so, that note, yeah. So, so uh, we'll close. Like, 
like to close right um whatever we believe about the future mm -hmm. As Christians, we should not have an ends justify the means nope. attitude towards getting there. Destroying the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque would be a stupid thing to do. Um, and we shouldn't be kind of considering that. We shouldn't be trying to sort of trigger some sort of Jesus Returns countdown by playing geopolitical chess. We should be loving our neighbors, investing in the good of Israelis and Palestinians, um, trying to make you know, sensible, loving steps for the future of both sets of people and the uh, times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, as Jesus says in Acts 1, yeah. right. his business, not ours. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would just like to add is, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of the Jal, right? And, um, you know, it's, it's linked to Antichrist, right? It's this idea that there's this religious mm. figure who will come and deceive and you know the new testament talks about that too right and it was prefigured in the old testament um so where i land with all of that is listen there are in the scriptures it clearly says this is what the messiah will do when he comes this is who the messiah is this is you know his character his nature and we see those things revealed in in jesus we don't see them revealed in other places. So what I would encourage anyone to do is to go back to the source material. Yep. Yes. Right? Go back to source material and read it and, you know, let it speak for itself. Because, you know, there's so many YouTubers, like, we're just watching YouTube videos. You, you know, we watched a couple in preparation for this. They're ridiculous. Yeah. Right? Like, it's, you know, so it, it's, so, it's hard to watch. And so here's the interesting thing, right? You don't have an in the in Islamic eschatology, the, the Islamic side of the end times. You don't have an anti-prophet. You have an anti-Christ, which functionally still makes the Christ the central figure. Yeah. Right. right. So, uh, my Muslim listeners, uh, what I'd suggest to you, right, if you want to really save yourself from the false Messiah, the Antichrist, then the best thing you can do is study the life of the real Christ, find out who he is. And that is a standard by which you will be able to detect all the frauds. Guys, thank you for listening to Christ and Caliphate. We'll be back next time.